What we've come to realize is Navajo Power envisions success with communities in terms of like, although there's expectation that they have to be profitable, profit isn't the driver. What's the driver is the legacy is of these projects because that's what we saw missing from coal. When they picked up those smokestacks, when they covered up those coal mines, the legacy it leaves behind is just fractured community. And that felt to us very problematic. And we didn't want solar or wind or whatever clean tech we could bring to have the same effect because our communities have been traumatized enough. Brett, I appreciate you being here with me on the Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation Podcast. Uh, for folks who are unfamiliar with you and the, the work that you do, would you mind introducing us? Sure. Thank you for having me. My name is Brett Isaac. I am a founder and the executive chairman of Navajo Power, uh, a member of the Navajo Nation. Uh, for my, my Navajo relatives, uh, uh, and for those non-Navo speakers, I just introduced my clan. So if there's relatives out there, they know they're related. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I'd love to, to start, Brett, with how uh, your uh, origins into clean energy began. I, I think you've, you've been in this space for uh, over a decade now or so, uh, maybe even more than that to my knowledge. But I'd love to hear... What had you interested in in power and clean energy specifically and, and what got you started? Yeah, I think, you know, like I, I come I always say like I was born in the shadow of a coal mine. You know, there there was a um, you know, the region that I grew up in, uh, coal was the economic driver. And so my family and relatives either worked at the coal mine or or the coal plant or, you know, did something kind of auxiliary to it. Um, but after college, uh getting home one of the tasks that was really highlighted was one, we're really reliant on that economy being present. And there's a lot of discussion around transition and eventual closure of the coal mine and coal plant, which subsequently have, have closed. Um, the other thing being the challenges that we're facing locally in terms of energy access. And so my, com my dad's community kind of came up with the idea of putting together an off-grid company. And I just happened to walk right in when they needed someone to run, you know, um, run, run the plan through through the ringer and uh, essentially, you know, put together my first um, off grid company. It was about like maybe 25 um, trying to use the local resources, you know, build things. I grew up in an area where it wasn't easy to, to, to just go down to the hardware store and pick up equipment. So solar's always been like that. The technology's been in some ways a little too expensive. You know, panels were very expensive back, back 10 years ago, um, as was access to capital. And so logistically, I had to figure out a lot of those things and how to pair them with energy access, economic development, um, and then just make them profitable because <laughs> we can't uh, we can't do things unless there's a return or, or or there's a lot of you know downtime in between waiting funding cycles and so um, my full way into it was essentially because there was a need for energy and a need for diversification. Mm. What what was the the conversation uh, like? Within your your family and and maybe your uh, you know any other friends or community members involved in uh, 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 the the coal power sector, uh, what was the conversation like around the transition? A, a lot of times it was a bit you know contentious in terms of mm. you know although like they didn't see me direct back then I wasn't directly competing with you know the power plants at the time but they saw. The, the transition as somewhat of a uh, as a threat to their livelihood, um, mm. and although and I, I have a relative who, out of high school, got a job at the coal mine and never had another you know position anywhere else, and so his livelihood definitely his track record his history was tied to it, and you know I think for them, I understood the scarcity, but I also knew that 
that scarcity would eventually be met with market forces we couldn't control. And so, Mm -hmm. although I knew that, you know, it may have been painful conversations at family gatherings, it, it was really important to express that, you know, this is about trying to find other options and alternatives to what we're doing, not about trying to challenge the existing systems. Um, Mm. And for them, I think it took a little while, but eventually, and and now, you know, they're very supportive of my work because they realize what those economies were like, were kind of living on borrowed time. You know, Mm. like there, there was always this like presence that, you know, I, I kind of at the time referred to it a bit as like we were a bit imprisoned by the economies at that point, meaning that mm-hmm. when, you know, coal was down, our communities were down when, you know, we had regulatory, um, you know, threat. Uh, they they used the unions and the localized communities to kind of vocalize against them, not realizing like the interest of the transition was actually an opportunity for our communities to build their own capacity. Because the other challenge was in those companies, I never saw our communities rising to the levels of leadership. You know, I never seen in in the Peabody Westerns of the world, you don't see Navajos in the Um, (laughs) C-suite, which I always felt was another barrier in terms of being able to control our vision was, you know, the economies were being kind of managed by external forces, which really felt un- um, you know, unorganic to me. Mm. Certain, certainly something it seems like on a, on the global scale, uh, is quite present in our <laughs> modern day conversation around, around the news. Um, and, and so I guess the, the transition, uh, um, perhaps, uh, continued and you mentioned that the coal plant is, is since been shut down. Um, sounds like your family had some some hand in in starting a, a new projects a, out of that, as you mentioned, your dad uh, um, with the interest in the off grid uh, company. What 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 is the the circumstance for the community now that you grew up in? Do you feel like those those jobs have you know maybe not one for one the exact people that worked there now work you know in in clean energy? But do you feel like there there's been a sensible transition and a reasonable transition for uh, the community with economic opportunity uh, with the new energy transition? I I think that's yet to be realized. You know, one of the things that kind of unfortunately happened is, you know, I think a lot of our members and our leaders went down with the ship. You know, they, they, Mm. until the final hour, were trying to negotiate deals and held on to like some sort of hope. Now we know for certain, like the certainty is probably the best thing that could have happened. Because Mm -hmm. it it really put to bed the idea that some revival was going to be the economic, you know, savior for for our communities. And instead, what people are working on now is diversification in terms of, you know, I've seen a lot of people come out of um, their their mine operations to start businesses, you know, to to start tourism, to go into alternative industries that are, you know, a little bit more um, entrepreneurial. Uh, mm. in the region. And so, you know, uh, unfortunately, COVID and, and the pandemic had an, another um, another blow to give to, to the communities. But I think the resiliency of the people is really about trying to find options that fit the lifestyle, you know, so mm. we're very um, traditional in, in, in terms of like, we, we live rural, rural um, in kind of a rural community. Growth is not something that we're looking at in terms of metropolis, it's it's more about, you know, gaining good, you know, sustainable employment that um, ensures that one, our family nucleuses can stay closer to home. Uh, Cause regardless of even like having a job in your community, that job could be a 40 mile commute one way. Um, yeah. And that's considered reasonable. So, you know, there, there, there does need to be some more additional work and, one of the things I guess I'm a little critical of the transition in is like there was a lot of discussion as to how do we help. Um, and I, I think there was a lot of conversation to push coal off the ledge, but there hasn't been a lot to actually like ensure those families impacted landed safely. You know, like, like mm. they're, they're, you know, a lot of them had to leave the region. We definitely saw a decline in, in um, you know, local um, participation and, and uh community engagement just because they had to go seek jobs elsewhere. Um, 
I think though that there is optimism that you know the recovery be a little bit more um, beneficial to the communities because we own the positions going forward, and we didn't own those coal mines, we didn't own the coal plant. You know, those weren't our decisions yeah. to close or to keep open, but we definitely held on to them like they were the only thing we had. And I kept mm. saying, you know, like I don't like that feeling, you know, because it feels like we're kind of entrapped to, to, to someone else's wishes. So I think it was necessary, but also at the same time, you know, working hard to try to replace those, those jobs has become somewhat of a personal goal. Mm. Hmm. Well, and I, uh, I'm very excited to, to dive deeper into that as, as we move forward in this chat. But Brett, I, I'm curious to hear a bit more about what your, your dad is like, I mean, it, the taking taking it on to to start an off grid uh, company himself and, and inviting you along for the ride there sounds like you have some some entrepreneurial spirit and ambition in in your genetics. Um, it, it, I would love to hear more about about what what about him and maybe your your family uh, has that yeah. makes so much sense. Well, you know, my my dad always had a side hustle. You know, like growing up, like. He had a job and then we did things on the weekends, you know, he was a fabric, he was a heavy equipment, op- heavy equipment operator, you know, um, a, a foreman by, you know, his, his nine to five. But during the weekends, you know, we would uh, do fabric welding and fabrication or do some sort of like side hustle. He was also, you know, um, a horseman. So we, we had livestock and animals. So I grew up in a, in, in a very like blue collar, you know, setting where, you know, once I was old enough to hold a flashlight, I had a job, you know, (laughs) and, and, and from that, I learned a lot of skills, which really helped me, um, you know, when, when the time came to start companies to really think about, well, how much of this do I actually know? And what kind of resources do I have? Um, that was a big part. My, my, my father has since passed, you know, he actually passed when I first started this company, but, you know, I, I, I find that his spirit in terms of what, I saw in resiliency in him is what I see in a lot of the people. And one of the things I always kind of thought about is, is if he had the same access to um, educational resources I did, he would have been a tremendous executive, you know, and, and leader. But one of the fact of the matters is that our communities, although they were, you know, used for economic gain of a lot of, you know, metropolises across the Southwest, one of the things that's been limited is the access of these communities to, to, to gain, you know, the, the advantage of like access to financial capacity, access to um, entrepreneurial accelerators and resources. So it's like, although he had the basics of, of like how to, you know, bring in resources and revenues, he just didn't have like the access to things that I'm, I'm fortunate and blessed to be able to have that has helped me accelerate and have a power to its position that it's in right now. Mm. Wow. Well, I, I'm, I'm so sorry to hear about, about your father's passing, but it, it seems like uh, you are keeping his, his spirit really kind of close at, at bay and, and guiding you forward. Hey y'all, Corey here. We're going to take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor. The Greater Good book is a call to action for everyday people, particularly women or others who may feel excluded from the traditional entrepreneurial stereotype to build businesses and initiatives that make a difference. Award-winning social entrepreneur Madeline Shaw paints a compelling portrait of an emerging group of changemakers, mostly female, diverse, and social impact focused. This cohort is the future of entrepreneurship, Shaw says, people who are motivated by the desire to fix problems and make the world a better place not just making a monetary profit. Most books on entrepreneurship focus on scaling fast and achieving celebrity status. In contrast, The Greater Good takes a more personal look at how people can tap into their sense of purpose to change the world, uncovering the emotional drive within each of us to fulfill our dreams. The book is a source of inspiration and encouragement and a practical resource for starting and running a successful project, business, or nonprofit organization, written in language that resonates with mission-driven individuals who may not relate to the tone of traditional business books. Check out The Greater Good, Social Entrepreneurship for Everyday People at greatergood.work. That's greatergood.work. 
Well, so one, what are some of those specifics in the things that, you know, elements of, of support or resources? Uh, you know, I know uh, you went to Arizona State University, perhaps. Maybe that's that's somewhere where you, you got a lot of uh, useful information and, and guidance. Well, what's, you know, been specifically and tangibly helpful for you, you feel like, in this experience of, of starting companies? Yeah, I think, you know, being a Sun Devil, you know, that was definitely the first, <laughs> the first, uh, it, you know, access point because of one, the, um, you know, the experience I got, you know, going to college when, when you're an indigenous kid is a, a kind of a bit of a shell shock. Like you're, you're, you're out of water, fish out of water. So what they say, because you're coming from a very rural community to one of the largest universities in the country. And it's, it's very difficult to kind of find your place. You know, a lot of, a lot of, um, our students tend to struggle because they're not in a setting where they get that level of support that they're used to being back home. Um, for me, it was for, I was fortunate to find a few mentors and a few friends that definitely kept me through. Um, you know, kept me like just this um, motivated to, to to actually finish. But one of like the other defining factors for me was I knew that you know to. I always wanted to go home with, with some sort of resource to be able to help. And from the university experience, you know, I learned about networking, I learned about leadership, but what I really studied was what was the um, like federal nexus to creating our tribes? What was the economic reasoning? Um, and in terms of policy, what was kind of holding us back? And I, I fortunately, because of like my family's position when I got home, was able to like put a lot of those thoughts and theories into practice. I started working with a, um, a nonprofit that was an economic development uh, or community development corporation. And we got to really analyze policy at a local level and implement some ideas. The current president to the Navajo Nation is Jonathan Nez. And when I, he's from the community of Shanto and he was a local leader, a, a, a local delegate um, when I returned back from college. And, you know, had a, had a great vision for what he wanted to see in that community. Working with my dad, you know, they, um, they, they in tandem kind of put together a lot of opportunities that then, hand, then were handed to me to carry out. You know, I, I, um, I got a project management job and, and essentially kind of did a lot of the um, foundational work, which gave me exposure to a lot of like rooms and, and networks that I would never have had access to. Um, but also to see like the direct impacts of economic development and how some of those like shifting narratives around transition and economy were just buzzwords at the time and not really being put into practice, you know, because there, there was a lot of like, you know, federal advocacy for putting dollars into it, but not a lot of champion building, you know, although there can be great plans, you still need people who can execute them. And part of the challenge we have in some of our, you know, communities, especially transition ones, is the talent drain that happens when the economies can't afford, you know, people to come in and, and um, help rebuild and reshape and retool the economic drivers of those communities. And so that was something I witnessed very, very early was like, I was the only one kind of doing the work. And there was a lot of, definitely a lot of people shouting like, this is what we should do and giving options. But there wasn't a lot of people getting, you know, into the nitty gritty, dirty work that was required, one, to, to face the challenge head on, but also to begin implementing plans in terms of like, you know, looking at different businesses and, and trying things like, you know, getting into the clean energy space and seeing whether it was a fit for the communities. Because even at that time, we had a skepticism that energy could still be weaponized against our communities as it had in the past regardless of who you know does the work it it seems like they tend to migrate you know like those same companies that were in uranium that were in coal mining that were in gas and oil they have their stickers on the back of solar panels now and so we wanted to make sure that if they were going to come back again they didn't again commit the same you know um missteps that they did in the past and our communities were better prepared for them. Hmm. Hmm. So it, it ultimately seems with, with the founding of Navajo, Navajo power that you've come around to the idea that, that clean energy is a fit for, for your community. 
Uh, and so I, I'd love to hear what, what sort of conclusions or understandings do you feel like you came to leading up to the, the, the very beginnings of Navajo Power, even the conception of, of the company that had, it seemed like the, the right time and the right fit. Yeah, I think, um, you know, first, like, you know, I, I had been doing the energy access challenge for a number of years, but, you know, one of the things that I, I kind of found was just entrepreneurship in that, in that kind of scale felt like, you know, a Rambo mission. It was me against the world kind of thing because I had to raise money build the systems, work with clients. Like it, it was just very hard to coordinate all those things together because scale was an issue. Like um, one thing I was kind of, you know, promote about the idea of solar is it's, it's entry levels is very scalable. You don't have to build, you know, a, a hundred megawatt power plant, you know, to, to get into solar. You can start with one panel, one battery and one home. Or even your RV, or or, or or you know a solar uh, phone charger. Like, there's so many levels that you can enter, and that it was one. It's not as prohibitive um, in terms of like you know if you have access to certain resources, you can enter into it. But it does scale when it comes to trying to deploy it on, you know, um, in I guess I'll call it a influential level, because you need to be able to sustain momentum in you know, your activity so that one, it builds the foundation of, of support, you know, that warrants some form of, um, you know, buy-in from community, buy-in from regulatory and, and policy. Um, Cause if it's just one off, it's, it's one project and then everyone leaves and we don't ever talk about it again, but if it's replicable, then it becomes something that, you know, is what movements are built on, that, that, that kind of shifts economies and shifts conversations around opportunity. And so at the time of like, right when, you know, I would say like five or six years into my clean energy experience, um, I had another, uh, you know, um, my, my, my Jewish brother, uh, um, there's a kid named Dan Rosen that we're about the same age. You know, he's from New Jersey, but he had spent some time in Navajo learning about our water and energy challenges. And we always kept in touch. He, he, he left to the Bay, um, you know, to, to, to do the Silicon Valley startup thing. He started a company called Mosaic. Well, I was back on, you know, on, on Navajo doing Shanto Energy and these other projects that had, you know, work in the energy access. We always tried to get together to figure out how to address the energy access challenge. How do we get more people power? How do we get more people clean water? And what ended up happening is when the transition talks were being discussed, you know, we had kind of gotten our companies to a place where like, we're, you know, we're like, we're a little burned out with what we're doing now. Let's, let's, let's get in, let's talk about something a little different. So there's a ceremony we we're at in, in the community of Shanta where in the middle of the night we're watching a fire and we start getting to talking about, you know, large scale development and why not us, you know, what, what, and what was interesting is like there's a there's a train in the middle at the time the coal plant was running coal you know um to navo generating station and we could see the train kind of going down the middle of the valley uh middle of the night and we're like man like if we don't get involved in in this discussion you know we don't have a say whether or not it's beneficial to our communities and this plant will close and our community will feel the impacts but they're going to build something else somewhere else and and you know if we want to hold these one companies and you know institutions accountable like it's got to be under our own control and so we reached out to a few initial investors and we cited a few initial projects and brought in and recruited you know a very strategic team um of like-minded and experienced folks to to get what Navajo power um, vision was, which is we wanted to bring clean energy uh, to communities in a different way. We wanted to be inclusive, but also work on this idea of community benefits. And what we've come to realize is Navajo power, you know, envisions success with communities, you know, in terms of like, although there's um, expectation that they have to be profitable, 
profit isn't the driver. What what's the driver is, you know, what you know the legacy is of these projects because that's what we saw missing from coal. When they picked up those smokestacks, when they, you know, covered up those coal mines, the legacy it leaves behind is just fractured community. And that felt to us very, you know, um, just, again, problematic. And we didn't want solar or wind or whatever clean tech we could bring to have the same effect because our communities had been traumatized enough. And so we thought, okay, well, how do we get involved? And so it really started with bringing together a lot of allies who had been kind of advising the space, very, you know, seasoned people like Danny Kennedy at New Energy Nexus to say, okay, can you get us into certain rooms? (laughs) Because we know if we can talk about this, we can build, again, a movement, but also a, um, uh, a very, like, intentional business model that that highlights the need for taking care of communities first where you impact and then exporting power you know Mm. i I think what you mentioned there is is critically important of uh, some of these different distinctions of actually what what it means to be a a socially environmentally responsible uh, and sustainable business you know the business and and you know as a product of that the the profit is really just the mechanism and the tool you know, that's at play. What is the core purpose? You know, the, the outcomes, the results that you're looking for, especially as you mentioned with Navajo Power, that's actually what, what should be the primary driver, you know, that that sort of legacy, as you mentioned it, therefore, uh, the community that that y'all are working in. Um, Brett, I, I'm curious, is is there some sort of uh, particular significance to, to you to being at the helm as the, the CEO and, and one of these founders? Um, you mentioned uh, earlier the the serious purpose that you get out of uh, um, you know being in the business of creating really impactful sustainable livelihoods for for members of your community. Uh, is there a particular significance to you to to being in this position in this role? Yeah, I mean, I think for me one of my criti- critical points was looking at energy companies, even the ones that were tribally created. They're always managed by external parties. <laughs> you know, it's like. You know, I, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a Navajo kid watching, you know, these companies being led by, you know, essentially white guys from outside of our communities, making big decisions on behalf of Navajo employees and Navajo livelihood. And I always felt like a disconnect in terms of like, why isn't someone I know in those positions, you know, for all the decades of service for all the, um, the, the the different contributions that we've made, why haven't Navos ascended to the sea levels, the C suites of these different companies? And part of it I kind of felt one was just, you know, that ceiling had yet to be really broken. But the other part was just it, it really showcased who was controlling, you know, again, our economies. And so for me being in this position was intentional for a few reasons. One of them is like, I wanted our youth to see, you know, what leadership could look like, what what we could do, even though you're born in, in a place that's very rural and you don't have access to the traditional resources that, you know, most Americans enjoy. You know, I, I didn't have, you know, where, where my family's from didn't have running water until maybe like five or six years ago. So my first couple of businesses, you know, we had to haul in water and, 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 you know, that was, you know, some part of the day that me and my employees had to figure out. Um, but, but, you know, those kinds of things, like they, they instill a bit of like resiliency, but also, you know, some, some degree of strength around like your intention. So the purpose is pure, you know, and, and for me, like, that's what I will like. And it's not like I, I was critical of the people who were leading our companies. I think they had great hearts, but I think their, um, their rationale for why they were doing what they were doing wasn't relatable to someone who grew up in those situations. Right. I, I think that that's an important separation between, you know, the, the individual and maybe the systems and the structures at play, you know, as you mentioned, you know, perhaps the, the individuals had, good hearts, but if we have systems and structures, you know, economically or socially or whatever set up, 
we're going to see a particular set of outcomes, you know, where that, that driver is, is profit. And then when that's not available and coal is not a feasible energy source anymore for, you know, whatever reason, environmental sustainability, or, or it's just run out in the area. Uh, you know, there's, there's not much concern of, of what's being left behind. Um, well, uh, I, I think that, that, that speaks to a lot, Brett, and I, I'd love to transition a little bit, uh, to, to some of the, the tactical and kind of strategic, uh, perspective that, that you have with Navajo power as to, you know, we're, we're all thinking about this clean energy tr- transition here in the U S and I mean, obviously globally as well, but particular to, you know, what, what you see as your purview as the, the, the challenges, the kind of scale and the scope of the transition that's necessary in in the Southwest region, um, how how are you seeing uh, your kind of largest challenges and barriers starting to to or or initially stacked up into us getting the the, the clean energy transition that we need? So, one of the things that you know we if we get down to the numbers is we've realized there's going to be a closure of you know, uh, you know, a few dozen gigawatts of, of coal resources on tribal lands. Um, directly replacing those, I think, is important. Um, but the the challenge is, we know the conversion. You know, the 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 transition um, of a lot of our current energy resources is going to put a strain on the Western grid system as well as, you know, the communities that had relied on these, these um, traditional, I guess I'll call them fossil fuel technologies. Um, what I kind of envision in terms of like the need and, and kind of desire for, you know, Navajo Power's position in this is, you know, it's if we're going to get to these targets by the time we need to get to them, we got to be collaborative. And, you know, there's never been a push like this in the past in terms of like, we've never had to convert, you know, one of our systems this quickly um, because of the impacts of what things like climate change and also, you know, the the impacts of that climate on on the economies are are very um, intertwined. And so the collaborative nature means that like regulatory and business have to kind of work at the same speed. <laughs> and so getting that, you know, those communities ready is going to require a big lift, you know, because we know government doesn't always move the way it should. And also it's influenced by a lot of external factors. But what's really happening, though, is the markets are showing, you know, that, you know, wind and solar and and other clean technologies are definitely meeting the challenge that they weren't supposed to meet. You know, they were supposed to be too expensive and too, I mean, even the discussion today is, well, they're intermittent and they don't, you know, doesn't the sun, the sun doesn't shine 24 hours a day, but that's not the first knock against solar. You know, it used to be that it was too expensive. Now that's, it's half the cost of coal. You know, it used to be that it was prohibitive, you know, and we're facing some unique challenges in that market in terms of, you know, we still need to clean up, you know, the way that we procure, you know, modules and and who makes the modules and what we're doing, you know, in terms of we're not just passing on, you know, trauma to other communities because we want a cheap product. You know, I've always felt like energy um will go the way that food has gone meaning that you know we love our local producers because you know buying something from them recycles economy but also we knew who we know who grows it we know where it's from you know we we have a um a, a sense of like you know knowledge that it, it it was done ethically um one of the things about energy in, in the indigenous experience is we always felt like sacrifice zones. <laughs> you know, we always felt like, you know, in order to build a uh, metropolis like Los Angeles or Las Vegas, someone had to, you know, um, subsidize. It. And it, it fell a lot on rural communities in the West who, you know, had no decision whether or not 
you know, they wanted to continue to support that. So I think there has to be a conversation around like make making sure the transition is equi- equitable to those communities. But also that, you know, when we cite opportunities, we look at replenishing those those places with those types of work like manufacturing um, and production. I mean, we're having such a large conversation now about the West and the grid system. Like it was built for one purpose, like to, to get electrons to those metropolises. And now we're realizing, well, there's people that live beyond those metropolises. So how are they going to get service, you know? And it works kind of that way, which is the economic centers are dictating, you know, what type of energy they want. And as they keep influencing that market, you know, the, um, the, the power producers like us have to figure out how to intertwine our opportunities into their planning. Um, I think a unique priority that Naval Power is kind of placing is that you know, we know how to probably get to like 50%, you know, power, which is what we have today. But with the conversion, of, again, of, of our systems to all electric away from fossil fuel sources, it's just going to increase the need. So the closure of, you know, a couple dozen gigawatts of coal is the small conversation of the increase of the gigawatts we're going to need um to convert our vehicles to evs to convert our appliances to to electric to um essentially modernize our our system in in, in the west and i feel like that's the important conversation where tribe tribal opportunities as well as natural power um can help facilitate those you know because one other element that's fighting against us is land access you know i think all the um the uh, easy, accessible, developable projects around those metropolises are taken up. And the growth of the West and the shortage of water, <laughs> like there's all these factors that I wake up and think about and say, okay, well, what can Naval Power do to, to help with these things? Um, those are all adding into the element of why we're starting today and getting projects ready, you know, for, for the near future is, you know, unless we have opportunities and pilots to work off of, you know, they will be sighted somewhere else and there'll be some other opportunity. But, uh, you know, fortunately, what I think is, you know, we have a bit more of a, of a control as a country in terms of what we want to do. And again, we're willing to pay a little extra if we know where it's coming from and if we know that we're citing things specifically. And, you know, food security is a, is a good indicator of that, where, you know, the priority now um, is to understand what we're eating and where we're getting it from versus just trying to get the lowest cost possible. And, you know, we're, we're not verifying where it comes from or whether it's safe. Mm. Mm. I think that's a really good comparison uh, to to think through. Do you do you feel like Navajo Power is is getting the the pilots and the the opportunities uh, to have the momentum that you need to be well placed to be a provider and a, a, a you know a solution for many of these problems that you just listed there, land, water, or otherwise? I think so because one of the one of the challenges to like citing these resources is proof of concept. You know, again, people love to talk theory, but to get actual work done and to have like tangible assets is really the name of the game when it comes to development. Um, You know, you look at all these funding opportunities that are kind of rolling through from the federal level, really what they're targeted at is continuation of existing projects. If those projects don't have the initial feasibility and viability um the funding just exhausts and then it goes back in the pot yeah. and the tribes are like well what happened there was money available it's like well we have to invest to a certain stage and that's what Naval mm-hmm. power believes is the most important piece is you know we have to get kind of up off the ground we can't just say oh i want to do this and then all of a sudden someone will put money for it. it's like no we got to put together the legwork um to to really point our position um you know in terms of like being intentional of developing these projects we have right now about you know one and a half gigawatts a little more than that just on the navajo nation that we've been working Mm -hmm. on for the last few years we have one project which has kind of been public which 
This is 750 megawatts um, solar plus battery storage project located in an area that used to service the entire Southwest. You know, um, the coal plant up the road was owned by the city of LA, um, eight Arizona Public Service, Salt River Project, Tucson Electric Power. So it's like we know the markets, you know, um, have the ability to procure power. They just needed something to prove that, you know, we can site structure and make a market competitive project on tribal lands. And we knew we needed to get there because although we can talk responsibility, you know, without some sort of um, pilot in place, you know, some sort of project to point to or some sort of tangible thing to talk about, you know, we can talk accountability all day long and people can make commitments and come up with their buzzwords and phrases and then just say, well, there was nothing there. So we're going to keep moving, you know? Um, and I've seen that happen time and time again. So like the, the real kind of take to task is we got to get these communities ready, but with viable projects in hand. And that's the way we will participate. Cause it, I think of it as a, it's a not, not a matter of if it's a matter of when um, the need is going to mm. be that great in terms of what energy resources um, are needed in the West and what energy resources will be needed nationally. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that that's an ever present, uh, and impending conversation. Uh, it seems like it's, it's changing shape, uh, week after week, if not day after day right now. Um, well, uh, uh Brett, um, I, I'm really curious to hear a, a bit more as to, you know, h- how Navajo power as a, a business model is managing and perhaps setting, setting a standard for what a more equitable clean energy transition looks like from a, a provider, you know, just at the overarching, as an example, y'all are a public benefit corporation. You know, I, I'd love to hear well, what's the significance of that uh, to y'all as a provider and uh, perhaps, you know, what sort of kind of trickle down principles or, or themes or things of, of importance uh, stand out uh, to, to y'all and how you operate the business and, and see to continue to expand and, and grow the model. I think one of the one of our main principles is like there used to be a top down approach to development. You know, we always look at the the pyramid. It, it was always, um, you know, we're the developer, we're the money. You know, this is what we're going to offer. You know, take it or we're moving next door. You know, and I've always felt that was you know a bit you know one just aggressive, but the other is it it didn't build buy in to the need for. Um, what our economies could look like with opportunity. Uh, we want more people engaged, not more people upset in the tactic. <laughs> you know, so we work very intentionally on what we call, you know, a um, grassroots level up approach, which is we engage community as a whole. Um, you know, because one thing about government right now, as polarizing as it is, is you know, participation is, is really about trying to be inclusive, you know, um, no matter the stance or the situation, opportunities should be partyless, you know, it should be about everyone gaining something um, from, from at, at least having the option to participate and the option to have a voice. And I think that's something that's been a bit kind of, missing in this conversation because there's a lot of pointing fingers back and forth. And our approach really is when we look at the impact of our projects, um, we look at two factors. One is just the, you know, what is our project going to do to the local region, whether it's land usage, um, what kind of resources can it bring? The other is envisioning success with, with them in terms of, Like, what are their metrics for what they see, um, you know, a a project like this doing? We wanted to be disruptive in that space because we knew most developers come in with a dollar figure and kind of a take it or leave it attitude. What we wanted to do is show them, like, a bit more transparently, well, this is what the market can bear. What do you want to do with this? What do you see as being... Like the reason, and you start to find out it's not so much about like, oh, we need X amount of lease payments and X amount of dollars. 
it's that, you know, oh, we want jobs or we want to invest in, in, in water infrastructure or we, so success looks very different depending on the community. The other thing that I always kind of explain is a lot of our communities have never seen their, their, um, their, their land from a map view. So like no one owns helicopters or routinely flies over the land. So when you show people a map, like, they don't really understand even what they're looking at. So you got to go back up, back to the ground, walk around with them, get the history of the, of, of the location so that they actually understand what you're talking about. You know, there's been an interpretive barrier in, in the development of these projects for a while, which creates that hostility, you know, even in solar. You know, I've driven by plenty of, you know, solar farms to see their neighbors, you know, bad mouthing the project or the company to know that like we can't keep doing that and expecting people to believe in the transition or believe that clean energy is any better than what has come before us we got to be better about that and so navo powers kind of initiative really is to set the standard on community engagement you know we can do better than just offering dollars you know we have access to certain you know, types of expertises and guidance that we can extend to our communities so that they can replicate, you know, the development model to build something they're passionate about, whether it be like they want a school or a community center, they can look at how we acquired land, how we financed it, use, you know, the momentum of our economic impact to build upon what we envision as success. Um, and I fully believe like that's how holistic we have to think about energy transition is, you know, anyone can put up solar panels, you know, like that's, that's kind of a given, but can you do it while maintaining a high level of popularity that your panels are contributing back to, to the people or are they just benefiting a select few? So the challenge I've kind of put in front of our team and in front of, I guess, our industry is how do we be better because that's what the market demands of us if we're going to continue to build at the scale and pace that is required to meet these you know um resource challenges that, that we're going to be facing mm. wow i mean I, I just thinking through the the different kind of stakeholder communication that, that needs to be done as as a provider you know, as a, a a business in this space, it's different than than say someone who's you know selling a consumer product like a, a t shirt, as an example. Like your the the level of communication and you know on the ground, as you mentioned there, speaking to to residents, perhaps walking properties, you know, walking community land. Uh, it's a whole different level of of uh, I don't know intricacies and relationships that it seems you have have to navigate. But it seems like you personally, Brett, and, and Navajo Power are, are well positioned and well skilled to do so. But um, I do appreciate you spending so much time with me here this morning. Uh, I, before we we wrap up, I'd love to ask you a, a few rapid fire questions. You mind if I sure. I get after them? Let's do it. Hey, y'all, Corey here. We're gonna take a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor. Being an entrepreneur is tough especially when trying to run a business in a socially and environmentally conscious way. Having a community striving for the same type of impact makes the process easier. And knowing that others are reaching for the same goals is incredibly motivating. That's why our friends at Oliver Russell created the Social Good Network. The Social Good Network is designed to connect socially minded entrepreneurs and their employees with the community and tools they need to grow. The testimonials and reach that they've already seen have reiterated how much of a need there was for a community like this social good network. They've seen heartwarming testimonials, one-on-one -on -one connections, and engagement from over 10 countries so far. Visit socialgoodnetwork.com to create your profile today. Again, that's socialgoodnetwork.com. All right. So first one for you, uh, what, what's one book, film, or, or maybe other resource that you might recommend to our listeners, something that's either impacted you recently or you always come back to in it? It can be about the subject matter we've talked about today or, or out of the park. So don't, don't uh, hold back. 
I would say one book I recommend to our team members when they join Navajo Power is Blood and Thunder. And it's about Kit Carson and the Navajos. So it's a bit of history, but also what kind of laid the foundation for the uh, relationships in, in the Southwest. Mm, excellent recommendation. Uh, next one for you. Are there any particular morning routines or, or daily habits that you, you absolutely have to stick to? Working out. Lifting weights has been something I've done since I was a little kid, you know, and uh, it, it's something I find passion in, but also I always say like, if you're going to work in some of these areas, you have to be not only mentally strong, but physically as well. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And then uh, a last one for you, Brett, maybe, maybe not so rapid fire. What's one piece of advice that you might leave our listeners with? These folks are, are change makers and innovators from all sectors all over the globe, uh, looking to leave the world a better place than they found it. One thing I, you know, one piece of advice that always sticks out to me that a uh, really seasoned developer said is, you know, projects will die a thousand times before they succeed. You know, so don't lose hope when things look a little bleak or tough. And, you know, there, there's a discipline to what we're doing to, to contribute to the transition. And staying in the course is about, you know, just having faith when it's dark and also, you know, celebrating our wins when we get them. You know, we need to be appreciative of how far we've come as well as optimistic about how far we can go. Mm. Really important sentiment to, to leave us with. I'm going to take that with me on, on the rest of my day here. So thanks so much, Brett. Uh, final, final item. Where, where's the best place to, to keep up with you and, and follow along with Navajo Power? NavajoPower.com. Uh, we have an Instagram page, Navajo Power One. Uh, and, you know, you can look me up on LinkedIn at, um, just look up Brett Isaac and, you know, I, I, I love the, um, to, to meet, meet a lot of, uh, the movers and shakers. So I really appreciate you inviting me to, to speak here today. Well, 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 thanks again for, for taking the time. Really my pleasure. And we'll have all things linked up in our, our show posts at growensemble.com and socialentrepreneurship.fm. Brett, thank you once again. I really appreciate it. Thank you.